card from the pew back in front of you, or it's over on the sides there if you don't have a pew back that you can reach, and fill out that card. Well, one side says visitors, one side says members. Fill out the one that you need to, and just pass that to the end of the aisle. Uh, set that there. Some uh, young people will pick it up a little bit later in our service, so we can have record of your attendance with us today. Also, if you would take a minute and check your cell phones or any other electronic devices, if it makes any type of a noise, even if it hasn't made that noise in a while, if you would take a look and see, make sure that's turned off uh, or turned off to mute so that it does not go off at, uh, at some of our inappropriate times or also just uh, so it does not disturb you nor those around us. That would be great and will help us with our services this morning. As we get ready to enter into our services, if uh, you'll notice that you were handed the bulletin that, to come in that has all of our uh, order of the worship as we go through today and that we will be following. Our first song today will be song 299. We'll be singing 299 going straight from there into 916, I'm sorry, to 937 and to 938 as we open our services and as we focus upon God and the fact that we are in His presence. If you would, let's stand for these songs as we begin our services. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with a ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see, T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to who all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord. Please be seated as we enter into prayer by Ron Jones.
our most holy Lord. You're truly Lord above all lords and God above all gods. You are exalted and we praise thee. That you're gracious to us. You've blessed us and been with us and watched over us. You cared for us and you provided for us. We're thankful to Heavenly Father for the many blessings that you've blessed us with. We're thankful to Heavenly Father for the congregation here at Bridgewood. We're thankful for Ed and for John and others, especially for the elders. And we pray to Heavenly Father that you'll be with each one, that you'll guide them in your truths, You'll help them, them to lead us in the right direction also. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, as followers of your word that we'll do right in your sight and walk in your ways. Thank you again for being good to us and being with the congregation here. And we pray that you'll help us, dear Heavenly Father, to spread your word in your will in this area. Thankful to Heavenly Father for missionaries that we have overseas and in other places. We pray that you'll bless them and strengthen them, especially be as the ones in Dominica. Pray your blessings on <clears throat> our sick. Your Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be at each one especially. Please be with Bobby Jeter and bless her, and please be with Dorothy Middleton and bless her, and please be with Tanya Williams and bless her, and please be with Karen Mullins also and bless her. Please be with Santino Blake and the doctors waiting on him and his chemotherapy, and please be with Audrey Bach and the doctors waiting on her and her chemotherapy, and and please be with Jim C and. The doctor is waiting on him in his, chemo, in his chemotherapy. Pray that you'll be with Jim Kite and the fact that he's needing a trans kidney transplant and that he's on dialysis. We pray that you'll bless him, strengthen him, be with him. Forgive us, dear Heavenly Father, when we do things wrong or fall short in your service. And please be with us this hour, especially be with Ed. He brings a lesson to us. And us as we praise thee in song, we pray that you'll bless us and bless him. Again, please forgive us and guide us and help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song number 916, we'll be singing this as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Ted Nolan will have our communion thoughts right after this and as we move in that direction. 916, we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here, everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We are now a family. Of which the Lord is head, though unseen he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing, 
will see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. In Exodus 12, we read about God speaking to Moses and his brother Aaron, giving them instructions, as it were, on how the Israelites are to observe the first Passover, honoring the Lord, sacrificing a perfect lamb, brushing his blood on their doorway and side post, eating unleavened bread, establishing their covenant with God, remembering their salvation from Egypt and freedom out of slavery. But this was only part of God's plan, granted a very big part. God never wants us to sin, and he didn't want our sins pushed forward year after year. So he created an avenue for our sins to be forgiven, us to be his children, and ultimately spend eternity with him in heaven. Unfortunately, the cost for his plan included the torture and killing of his only son. God knew this. Jesus knew this. And yet they still did it, knowing it had to be done if we, the unworthy sheep, would have a chance of getting to heaven. Listen to Luke's brief account of Jesus' Passover with his apostles. Keep in mind, what happened here wasn't just happenstance. Jesus knew what was happening and what would happen and what ultimately did happen. This is found in Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. When Jesus spoke here of the new covenant of his blood being shed for you, he wasn't just speaking of the apostles. He lived his life to be our perfect sacrifice, to replace the old Passover and to remember the sacrifice he and God made for us to have salvation. In humbleness, may we show our gratitude and love at this time. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, thank you, dear Father, for allowing us to be here at this moment, dear Father, to memorialize your son, dear Father. We pray that the emblems that we're taking at this time will be taken seriously, dear Father, that we will never forget um, how your son suffered, bled, and died on the cross for us, dear Father. As we take this bread, dear Father, we want to continually remember how your son was nailed to the cross, uh, dear Father. We ask all this in Christ's name. 
Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Dear Father in heaven, as we continue around this memorial feast this morning, we're so thankful for your son and the gift that he gave us. We're so thankful for this cup, which represents the new covenant. Pray, dear Father, that we'll always be mindful of that great gift your son gave, dying and having his blood shed on our behalf, to have our sins washed away and be able to be made new again and able to abide in your presence. Such a great and wonderful gift, and pray to your Father that we'll never forget that great sacrifice. Pray that we'll take this cup in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now we come to another part of our service where we have an opportunity to give back a portion of our income that we've made throughout the week. Let us pray for the offering. Dear Lord, we want to first of all thank you for allowing us to be here in our right mind, giving us our health and strength to serve you, Lord. We also want to thank you for giving us your son, which is the great, greatest gift that can ever be given that we can not possibly pay back. And Lord, as we've taken up this offering, Lord, we just want to ask you to keep us in the right mind and realize where the money truly comes from, and we just servants of the money. We also want to pray for those that's overseeing the money, that they will take care of our services here in Fort Worth and also all throughout the country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Song number 947, we'll have this for our scripture reading. 947, Jesus draw us, come to know you, let us see you face to face, touch us, hold us, Use us, mold us, only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer, hold us in your loving arms. Wrap us in your gentle presence when the end comes. Bring us home. Carl. Scripture this morning will be from Matthew. 24, 42, 4 through 44. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord hath come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. If you're able, please join me in singing one more time as we sing song 674, There's a Great Day Coming. It's normally a song we sing after the sermon, but today it fits before. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming. There's a bright day coming by and by. But its brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? 
Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a sad day coming. A sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his doom depart, I know you not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? And please be seated. This time we'll have our sermon by Brother Ed, and our song after the lesson will be song number 255, I Am Resolved. Now, Brother Ed. Thank you, Ken, and good morning. You might want to open your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 13. That's where we'll begin reading this morning. Romans 13. As we observe the Lord's Supper this morning, as we do, of course, in scriptural direction every first day of the week, so we partake of the bread, remembering the Lord's words. This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. With the cup, my blood, new covenant given for you. The new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. But then we also observe the Father commands. Bread and drink the cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we observe where the Lord's design, his people are to be in constant remembrance, not only of what our Lord has done, but also what our Lord is going to do. He is coming again. And every first day of the week, as you partake, we are proclaiming our belief and our conviction. He is coming again. So we begin this morning by observing the importance of, of this day. The importance of being reminded continually of this day. The day of our Lord's return. And one thing we can put down is that his return is certain. It is certain. We're told in the book of Acts chapter 17 that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Through man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That day has been fixed. The idea being that it is set. It is established. It is sure. And when God fixes a day, when God fixes anything, when God establishes and sets a day, there's no individual, no group of individuals, no Supreme Court can do anything to change that. That day has been fixed. Jesus Christ is coming again. And as many times it is associated, the judgment day will be a day of wrath. The Apostle Paul reminded people of the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. That because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're throwing up wrath for yourself and the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It will be indeed a day of wrath. Horrible, frightening, and terrifying. A day of wrath. John spoke in the book of Revelation chapter 20. He saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books, according to their deeds. See, give up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to their deeds. Death and Hades were thrown into a lake of fire, this is the second death, the lake of fire. And there's no one in all the Bible who speaks more of hell, of suffering eternally, than Jesus Christ himself. 
the example of being book of Mark chapter 9 and 43 and 44. He warned against being thrown into or being in the hell, Gehenna, the unquenchable fire, as he calls it. The unquenchable fire. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Could you put off the thing at the back, please? Appreciate it. So our Lord Jesus Christ made very clear that that day will be a day of wrath, a day of the second death. All men, all things beneath, will die physically, unless, of course, our Lord returns. We'll all die physically. We'll all die once. But woe betend those who will die in the second death, who will taste of that second death. Because that second death is as Paul identifies in 2 Thessalonians, those who uh, don't know God, who don't obey the gospel, these will suffer the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That day will be a day of wrath. That day will be a terrible, horrifying day. A day when those who are not right with the Lord Jesus will taste of that second death, which will be an eternal destruction. Now, that picture isn't very popular with men. We would rather a deity, if there is a deity, we would rather a deity who would happily let bygones and bygones kind of wink at our failures, give us a pat on the back to build our self-esteem. One by the name of H. L. Milton, who was noted as a note as a literally giant, was an agnostic. Didn't believe you could believe. Didn't believe you could know. But he gave allowance that he might be wrong. And he had a plan that if he was wrong, and there is indeed life after death, and there is indeed a judgment, he had a plan. He imagined himself being confronted by the twelve apostles. So he was simply squared himself with the apostles, and in a genuine and sincere matter, said, gentlemen, I was wrong. And that would take care of the problem. Gentlemen, I was wrong. Robert Ingersoll, who back in his day was, of course, a well-known enemy of Christianity and, and uh, agnostic. He would travel the country giving lectures against the Bible. At one particular lecture where he was expressing his doubts about life after death, doubts about judgment day, not going to be such. And it said in the audience, an older man spoke up. He said, I hope you're right, Brother Bob, because I'm counting on that. And lots of people are counting upon the fact that those who dismiss the Bible and dismiss Judgment Day have got to, I'm counting upon that because if it's a Judgment Day, I am in trouble. As another observed, we may juggle human laws. We may fool human courts. But there is a judgment which is coming from which there is no appeal. That day has been fixed, and that day will be a day of wrath. But then as Christians remember and proclaim his coming as we do with the Lord's Supper, you recognize for Christians there are beneficial effects from being reminded he is coming again. Now tonight, Lord willing, will expand this in more detail. I hope you were here with us at five o'clock Bring your Bibles and be ready to study further on the promise of that day. But consider at this time the benefits, the beneficial effects that occur to Christians as we remember he is coming again. First of all, he promised. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And Christians hold that promise to heart. And so, as we hold it to heart, we're just like those in Thessalonica who turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, 
whom you raised from the dead, that is Jesus. And so as he promised, so we wait. And the idea of wait is to wait with, 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 uh, with patience and with trust. We trust his word. We trust his promise, I'm coming again. So we wait with patience and with trust. The Apostle Paul also observed in Titus chapter 2, grace of God appearing in salvation of all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire, to live sensibly, godly, and righteously in this present age, looking for, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we wait with confidence, patience, and trust. We are looking for, with expression again, that confidence we have. Our Lord promised, and he is coming again. So as we wait, and we trust his word, and we wait with confidence, then you observe it brings about a change in the behavior of those who are waiting. Deny ungodliness and worldly desire. Live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. If we truly believe he is coming again, we take him at his word, then our lives must change. Observe here in the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, where it's been discussing the importance of, of love and the application of love. So observe in verse 11, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awake from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than we may believe. Verse 12, the night is almost gone, and the day, the day is near. Therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let's behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh in regard to his lusts. You observe the change. If we believe Jesus Christ is coming again, how then could one continue or participate in carousing, in drunkenness, in all the deeds of darkness, in sexual promiscuity, indulging ourselves in the lust that's so easily at hand these days? You have a cell phone. You have a smartphone. Everything is right there. Quietly by yourself. Nobody knows. Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And so you recognize, if I truly believe the Lord Jesus is coming again, then my life must change. My behavior must change. And I'm changed for the better. Look also at the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, here is an extreme example of a change that is brought about. Slavery. No, the Bible is not endorsing slavery. It's simply this was a, this was a culture and society of that time. Roman Empire filled with slaves, brought in from all over the world. So if one is a Christian, is either a slave or a master of slaves, then behavior must change. So you observe in verse 22, slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external servants, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you do, do you work heartily. Ask for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So you have a slave who becomes a Christian. Grumbling, muttering, looking for an opportunity to rebel. No, you are now a servant of the Lord. And your behavior changes. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. And this, this extreme example of slavery, change came about that eventually ended up in eradicating slavery all altogether. But those who were involved in society that had slavery 
Your conduct must change because you know and believe you have a master in heaven. You're pleasing him and he is coming again. Changes something else. In Hebrews chapter 10, speaking there of those who are faithful are now beginning to slip. He reminds them of how hard one's been. He showed sympathy to the prisoner and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. No, it wasn't that the property had no value. It wasn't no quite flippant letting people just, but when it was seized, you accepted it joyfully because you know you have a better position and a lasting one. Same as the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5 and verse 40. If someone sues you for your shirt, give him your coat also. Because the material things are not the things of importance. Well, surely we want to have our homes, our furniture, our, our belongings. But in the final analysis, these things are not the things that are important. We have a better possession and we have a lasting one. So as we, as we are reminded of a Lord's return, it modifies our behavior. It changes us. We behave differently in keeping with the fact of our belief, he is coming again. So observe and heed the Lord's warning. Book of Matthew 24. Matthew 24. You observe in verse 1. You observe where Jesus came from. He came out of the temple. Going away, his disciples came up and pointed out the temple buildings uh, to him. Our Lord responds, Do you see all these things? True, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which is not torn down. These things. The temple. She's so speaking of the destruction of the temple. In verse 3. As the sitting at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? Or with the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Notice these things. Jesus answered and said to them, see to that no one misleads you. For many will come and say, in my name I am the Christ and mislead many. Now observe, many today are still being misled. These things. Being misled, you observe in verse 6, hearing of wars, rumors of wars. Verse 7, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines and earthquakes. Signs we're looking for. Signs of the end of the world. All these things in verse 8 are made of the beginning of the birth pangs. Speaks also in verse 15 of the abomination of desolation. Speaks also in verse 21 of the great tribulation and whole doctrines are built upon the great tribulation. Speaks also in verse 29 using the language of the prophets. In those days the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light, stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Observe in verse 33. He's talking to the disciples, sitting in the mud of olives. So you too, when you see all these things, when will these things be? When you see these things. Therefore, these are occurred during their lifetime. They were going to see these things, the wars, the famines. They would see what he called the great tribulation, the destruction of Jerusalem. They would see these things. So in verse 34, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And those will take these things as he discussed and said, these are signs of the end of the world coming. We can see them, famines and wars and earthquakes, all these things. No, our Lord said these things will take place during the lifetime of the disciples. Roughly be 40 years hence, before Jerusalem will be destroyed and the temple torn down, they would see all these things. But having said that, 
Verse 36. But of that day, and the Greek is more precise, of that the day, not these things that would take place in their lifetime. Now it speaks of that day. And that day is a day of his return. Of that day, an hour no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Even Jesus himself wasn't privy to that information, but the Father alone. He gives an example in verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man were just like the days of Noah. In those days, before the flood, eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. In those days before the flood, life was going on. Marrying, giving in marriage. Society was going on, life was going on, but remember also of those days. As in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, God saw the intent of man's heart was only evil continually. It was a society in, it totally and completely submerged in sin. Complete rebellion against God. So you observe, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Didn't understand what? Remember Genesis 6 and verse 3. God gave them 120 years. What was Noah doing? He was doing more than building the ark. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, Noah, a preacher of righteousness. What does a preacher of righteousness do? He preaches righteousness, showing the right way to live, be in harmony with God. So they didn't understand until the flood came. So the flood's coming, and that horrible day, as the torrents from the heavens and the fountains of the earth being opened, then they understood, oh, now I get it. Now I understand, Noah. But by that time, God had closed the door of the ark. Oh, they understood. They came to know that's what righteousness is. That's what Noah's message has been. But by that time, it was too late. You see, they heard the message, but they had dismissed the message. Something of an importance. And so you observe. Our Lord then gives an application in verse 42. That was true in Noah's day. Therefore, be on the alert. You do not know which day our Lord, your Lord is coming. They didn't know. They had a message, but they dismissed the message. So you'd be on the alert. Now, if we're on the alert, what does that require of us? Verse 33, verse 43. Be sure of this, that the head of the house had known at what time of night, at what time of night the thief was coming, could not have been, he would have been on the alert, would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour, well, you do not think you will. Being on the alert, then, requires being ready, being prepared. So how do we live? How is our behavior altered? Are we continually on edge? Right by the day? Continually on edge? Anxious? Give an example in verse 45. What's involved in being on the alert? What's involved in being ready? What's involved in being prepared? Who then is a faithful and sensible slave? Being ready on the alert requires being sensible and faithful. So the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave when his master finds them so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, to put in charge of all his possessions. So being alert, being ready, being prepared, involves therefore being faithful. And the idea is proven reliability. One who can be counted upon and being sensible or wise in our translations is one who attends to his master's interests. 
So you have one who is faithful, what is sensible. He's faithful because he or she is one who has proven reliability as those who attend to the master's interests. And so when the master returned, he found the slave so doing. The slave wasn't living in constant anxiety. The master, when we're coming back today, he simply went about doing what the master said, caring for the others, providing them their food, and doing as the master said, caring for the master's interest. It wasn't a matter of living daily with anxiety or, or fear. He just went about doing what the master had told them to do. On the other hand, verse 48, that evil slave says in his heart, now, was the evil slave at any disadvantage to the one who is faithful and sensible? No, no disadvantage at all. The evil slave had been given the very same uh, uh, directions, very same responsibility, very same privilege, and the very same information. The master left. He was left with a charge to do the master's will, take care of the master's household. He was aware of that day when his master would return. He was aware. No disadvantage. But what he was saying was, well, the master's not coming for a long time. I've got time. Surely I'll get some information about his coming. Someone will see him coming from the distance. Someone will let me know. I'll have time to put things in order. I'll have time to kind of... Wash the dishes, as it were. Get things ready. But he was lax. He was undisciplined. Whose interests was he attending to? Eating and drinking with the drunkards. He was thinking only of his own interests. Not concerned with the master's interest. Not concerned about so doing. He let things go. Because I've got plenty of time before the master returns. But then the master of that slave came on a day he did not expect him. The day came. And this slave was not found so doing, not adhering to the master's directions, not doing what the master required. He was lax, undisciplined, un faithful, unwise. And as a result, all the blessings and the promises that could have been his, all were lost. So an individual becomes a Christian. They become a Christian in their teens, maybe even sometimes earlier. And then I realized as time goes on and into late teens, early twenties, well, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't realize all the fun I'd be missing out on if I stuck to this Christianity stuff. Anyway, I've got time. I can change. When I'm older, I'll come back to the Lord. But to become entangled and never do. And that day comes upon them unexpectedly. Maybe tragedy strikes them themselves. Or they die in a condition, and that day comes upon them unexpectedly. And all the blessings that could have been theirs are lost. Heed the words of our Master. Jesus Christ is indeed coming again. His intention is to present us holy, blameless, and beyond approach. If we continue in the gospel, if we're not moved away from the hope of the gospel, if we remain faithful and true, present us holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the Christians, as we remember our Lord Jesus is coming again, never allow ourselves to become lax, undisciplined, give ourselves some leeway to be 
not as faithful as we should be, to take some, some diversions that maybe we shouldn't, to remain faithful and true. That no matter what, the Lord will find us so doing, faithful to his word, and faithful as serving every day of our lives. Hope you're with us tonight at five o'clock as we look at the promises of that day. But again, our Lord has fixed the day. That day is coming. That day known only to the Father. That day when we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The question is, are you prepared? This is the time to make preparation. Are you prepared? You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's no way to put on Christ, no way to be in Christ, unless on the basis of your belief of who he is. You're baptized in the water of the grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, raised as his children, and walking faithfully every day of your lives, not fearful, not full with anxiety, just busy about the life of one who's a disciple of Jesus Christ. So the question is, are you prepared? Don't bank on tomorrow. This is an opportunity. If you're not prepared, then we urge you, even this morning, whether it's coming forward asking prayers of your brethren, of being baptized in the Christ, respond to the gospel, and we stand together and sing. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, I is, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Please be seated.